You may be seated. If I can get Russell Tippin and Stacy Brown to come up and introduce the doctors they have brought with them. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open up the floor to let the doctors talk, uh, give us a little bit of background on the COVID, and just give us a little bit of an education. So. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Russell Tippin. I'm the president and CEO of Medical Center. And uh, I've, I have two physicians with me today. These guys are both serving as our interim chief medical officers. We have uh, Dr. Davenport and Dr. Benton. And uh, they are much smarter than me, so I'm going to let them talk here about the, uh, the virus and what, that, what we have going on and what's going on in our community as far as that's concerned. I will give you the latest update we have here. Um, we, we have confirmed another, so we have three uh, currently at Medical Center Hospital, three positive. Um, right now we have 49 tests that, that are done. Nine of them are pending approval, and we're waiting 10 results on those. So those numbers continue to increase on the uh, testing side of that, but uh, we do have confirmation of a third positive at Medical Center. So uh, that is hot off the press just uh, in the last couple, 30 minutes or so. Um, with that being said, I will turn it over. I'll let uh, Dr. Benton uh, come up here and just talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19. Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Tippin. Uh, I think you're smarter than me, though. So uh, COVID-19 is uh, obviously a respiratory infection. It is an infection that is new to all of our immune systems. So every one of us has the potential to get pretty sick with this. Um, the most important thing then is prevention and avoiding exposure of, of the virus. So I think what we're doing today is very important. We all need to stay home. What we're seeing is that this virus is spread obviously through travel and even now is beginning to spread within the community. So the more of us that can stay home and stay away from this, the better off we are. There, as it spreads and the numbers increase, that has the chance to overwhelm the medical system. At this point in time, we are fine, but you all hear about the flattening of the curve, flattening it out. If we do indeed have a rapid peak and rapid rise of cases, that could overwhelm our system. So it's very important to try to flatten this out, stay home, avoid keep our social distancing, wash your hands, stay away from this bug. When uh, you do come see us, we will provide supportive care, of course, support respiratory tract. There is very limited options available anywhere for treatment of this and even the, the medications that are potentially available are uh, not proven useful, are not proven to be necessarily a cure. So very important we stay away from this. From the national level, uh, you're probably all watching the press conferences. Dr. Burks, as you see when the president's team said something the other day that really struck me, and she said that the only way we'll de defeat this is at the community level. And it's right here where this begins, and we need to fight right here, but fight it through avoidance. So thank you. So some of the things that we're doing in a hospital level uh, to kind of fill everybody in, we've had a plan put together by the hospital staff, inclusive of Mr. Tippin in administration, incorporating the medical staff as well, staff nurses, and, and really everybody that, that is involved in the care of the patient at the hospital from the ground up. We've got, had a plan in place for a good three weeks now as to how we're going to manage these patients when they come in from our first patient to our second patient, our third patient, if that should be. The biggest concerns overall are, are we going to be overwhelmed like a lot of the other communities in the United States? And that's really an unknown answer. We think we have preparation for that. We've got a good plan for that, but we don't know to what extreme we will be taxed when it really hits our community. 
Um, everybody's done a good job in communication at the hospital with regards to these processes, and we feel that we've, we've really got a good system set up. We also recognize that during this time period, there's a lot of unknowns. What's going to happen? What are the contingency plans that we have? And will or have we thought of everything? We probably haven't. It's a very fluid situation. We're going to have to make a lot of, of decisions that we thought we had a plan for, and maybe something changed from day to day, something changes on a national level, or even in this community, which changes our thought processes. But probably the most important thing that the, the community needs to understand is that everybody in the health system, medical centers, working together to make this and take care of the patients here in the community. That's probably one of the points that we need to get across. We feel that we're, we're prepared. There are unanswered questions about how to take care of this, but as this or if this grows, we'll get those questions answered to take care of everybody. Good afternoon, I'm Stacy Brown. I'm the president of Odessa Regional Medical Center and I'm glad to be here to visit with you guys today. First and foremost, I want you to know that we've been working very closely with our other healthcare partners in the community over uh, the last three weeks as this really started to escalate. Um, we're in constant communication with not only the health department and the other community leaders, but especially with Medical Center, with Russell and his team. And we really do appreciate that partnership. So I want you to know that we're all on the same page. We also have the support of our corporate partner, who is Stewart Healthcare, who also operates 35 other hospitals across the country. And so we've got resources that are currently under evaluation and guidance that's been uh, sent to our facility uh, multiple times throughout the day. And so we're getting the latest information from experts who do nothing but are sitting back and, and working on gathering all these details as they change almost minute by minute. I have with me today my chief medical officer, Dr. Rohit Saravanan, who is definitely the medical expert on my team. And so I'm gonna start just with giving you some of the stats. Uh, for what we've seen so far at Odessa Regional, and then I'm going to turn it over to him to speak to you from a medical perspective. So as of 2 o'clock today, March 30th, we have sent out 37 tests to be tested. Of those 37, we have 26 of those that are still pending that we do not have the results for. Some of those have been pending uh, for over a week. We have five positive confirmed cases, and we have six that have been confirmed negative. Currently in our hospital, we have three patients that are admitted in our PUI unit, which is persons under investigation, and we have two others who are uh, admitted who are confirmed COVID positive for a total of five patients in our facility. Of those five, the two who are positive for COVID are currently on a ventilator. And so with that, I will let Dr. Sarah Vannon come up and give you some more information. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by saying sincere thanks to most of our medical community that is helping us in the front lines trying to fight this disease. You already heard the doctors speak about COVID. You talk, they talked about the importance of social distancing. I wanted to talk on separate topics on testing. So a lot of questions in the community about how much testing have we done, why haven't we done more, et cetera, et cetera. I want to explain a couple of things. Uh, COVID tests are viral tests. That's a type of infection. Uh, it is done with a swab that goes in your nose or your mouth, and it goes into a medium that carries that test to the lab where the lab can run that test. The medium in which we carry these swabs we were very low on right at the very beginning. That's not just us, that's the whole country. We were very low on those mediums. Now labs are able to run those tests with less medium, and they're also able to run the tests with alternative mediums, including saline. So that has increased the amount of tests available to us, limited only by the number of swabs that we have, and obviously limited by the lab's capability to run those tests and get us results in a meaningful time frame. So we have run, as you've heard, a lot more tests than you heard a few days ago. Our first cases for positive COVID came later than that of other places 
that have had it earlier than us. So perhaps their numbers are much higher than ours because we didn't have the need to start testing our traced contacts of those patients. So, so I just want to be clear on what caused us to have lower testing volume than perhaps other places because that was one of the questions that came up. CDC criteria is what we are following in order to do testing. CDC released criteria before. This is now three or four weeks ago and has changed the criteria in the last three or four days. So I want to talk about some of the criteria that was old and some of the criteria that's new and why that change causes us to test differently. The old criteria for the CDC dealt with travel history to level three countries, countries where COVID is rampant. It also talked about symptoms plus an exposure to a confirmed positive case. So the only people that got tested before were people that had symptoms and that had a confirmed exposure or a confirmed travel to one of those places. The third criteria was symptoms that were severe enough to require hospitalization. So you guys might have heard, oh, the health department didn't approve my test. Well, I want to clarify why, because the CDC's criteria clearly tells the health departments who were the priorities to test at the time when we had limited amount of tests. Now that we have more tests, CDC is also broadened the criteria. There is now priorities for testing. Priority one is patients that are symptomatic. And by symptoms, I want to clarify that the symptoms of COVID disease are fever, cough, and shortness of breath that are not explained by other disease processes. So you could have the flu, and that explains fever, cough, and shortness of breath, but that excludes you from the test. So if you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, not explained by another disease, that's the symptoms we we're talking about. So priority one again, for the CDC is symptoms in hospitalized patients or symptoms in healthcare workers. That's priority one. Priority two is symptoms plus risk factors. Risk factors are elderly people or people with comorbid conditions. And priority three is symptoms with essential personnel. So all the different industry, critical infrastructure industries. So that's three different priorities the CDC has released. That's the criteria that we are all using ourselves as well as medical center hospitals, which are the two major testing sites here in Odessa. There are also private doctor's offices that are running tests. The health department has been pushing for everybody to report into them when they send a test and they get their result back for these tests. But the numbers that they have and the numbers that they're releasing are the ones that are reported to them. I do want everybody to understand that as well. The one other thing I wanted to address today, and I brought these sheets because this will be useful for anybody. You can look this up. This is on the CDC's website. These are the three different priorities released by the CDC. I'll hand these out to the media. They can post those or they can post the links. This is the Texas Department of Health's testing criteria that's also uh, available online for everybody to look at. Last piece of paper was the criteria for how to discontinue home isolation. So we will release this as well, and this will be useful for people that are being told isolate at home. When can you stop isolating at home? When is it safe to do so? We'll release this as well. This is, again, available through the Texas Department of Health website. We'll post those links. That's all I had for now. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? There's a microphone right there, Ms. Peggy. Um, I can ask on what the process was for testing, and, and the chief gave that to me. Um, but I was curious, when it, it, it sounds like it starts, if you have these symptoms, you call your physician. Is that right? Are you able to go to the hospital, to the emergency room? Or what if it's a person that doesn't have a physician? Can they walk into a clinic? I mean, a lot of people do not have a, a regular physician that they see. So what do they do? Um, great question. As far as the medical center is concerned, if you, if you think you, ha you have symptoms, we're urging people to go to our urgent care centers because we're trying to leave the emergency room open for emergencies, the heart attacks, the, the, I got an appendix problem, whatever that is. We want to drive these cases to the urgent cares. 
that's where um, we've, we're set up. I know, um, Stacy, I'll let her comment on her situation, but I know we're very similar in both of us, uh, both these facilities the same way, the urgent care to get that screening done so we can keep the, we don't want to overload the emergency room. And uh, so far it's been working. We've seen that, that our, actually our number in our ER has declined while our numbers in our urgent care have increased. So that message, thank you for that question. That gives us a chance to get more of that information out. But if you think you've got it or you don't have a primary care physician, but you're looking to get examined, we recommend going to choosing an urgent care setting. Do you want to say anything about that? So Odessa Regional Medical Center does have an outpatient testing facility. All it requires is a doctor's order, and the doctors will be following exactly the criteria that I showed you that's available on the CDC's website. Uh, there is, uh, if you look on our website, you'll find the line to call uh, if you need advice from a nurse. Uh, but if you have a doctor's order, you would come to our outpatient testing center at Odessa Regional. Let me, let me give you one more perspective. COVID-19 is a pandemic right now, and it's a virus, as we heard before, that's going to affect probably around 50% of our population. So let's say you do feel sick. Just because you feel sick doesn't mean you need to seek medical care at that time. So just because you feel sick doesn't mean you need to go see a doctor because there is no other treatment we would do differently than regular over-the-counter medications that you would take to support yourself at home. So if you have a cough, a cough syrup. If you have a fever, antipyretics, things that break fever, like Tylenol and ibuprofen. Those are the things that we are recommending to everybody across the board. So you don't need to seek care unless you feel like your symptoms are not being controlled by the supportive measures that you're normally doing at home. So I'll give a little bit more information, right? So 50% may get the infection, but that doesn't mean all of them will require care. We don't have enough data to exactly predict who will require care and who wouldn't, but there are two countries that have gone through it and gotten rid of it already, and so we have some data. So if we have to look at that data, we're looking at a much smaller percent of people that will actually require hospitalization and care. So to answer your question exactly, no, we are not looking at alternative sites, but within the hospital capacity. I spoke last week and I said we have about 200% capacity compared to what we would before, but we're hoping that we don't have to utilize that capacity if we do flatten the curve, as uh, Dr. Benton was mentioning. Okay. Appreciate that. Just to follow up with that as well, those are conversations that are happening at the incident command level, and I think that all possibilities are open. Um, contingency plans, we've got contingency on top of contingency. Uh, I know we've talked about empty buildings we have, about churches, just, just trying to keep all those in the conversation. So I think the simple answer to that would be that all options are on the table when it comes to exceeding capacity of either one of our hospitals. Sound good? Great. Anything else? Thank you. Come on, Stacey. I th think you are on the right track. And then the social distancing is one thing we're both talking Here, scoot over. The one thing that we're both <laughs> really talking about is the washing your hands, staying at home. I can't tell you how bad my face is itching right now, and I want to scratch it. But I know we'll be all over YouTube if we do that. So I think you're on the right track. I think one thing that we're both trying to, to project and give to our community is that we're ready. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. Stay at home, wash your hands, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself at home first. If you, you can't 
handle it there, then seek treatment outside of that if it's not an emergency. But um, I think that's something we're both trying to, to get out there. I agree. And as Dr. Sarah Vannon said earlier, uh, or alluded to at least, 80% of the people who get this can recover at home. They'll be fine. But if that 80% of the people that get it are out running around the community, then it's going to spread much, much quicker and much further than it needs to. So really, we just can't stress enough the importance of the social distancing. If you don't need to be outside of your home, then don't go outside of your home. The essential personnel are the ones that really need to be out, those of us that are trying to take care of the community and leading the community through this crisis. So those people know who they are. If you're not one of those people, please stay home. You know, we've gone through a lot of different scenarios as we've planned how to use the different resources that we have, and the South Campus is our campus that you're talking about. We've decided based on the additional capacity that we were able to bring into our East and West Campuses, our main uh, facilities where we provide direct patient care, we've got the resources there that we need, and so we are using the South Campus at this time to be able to house any of our staff who have been exposed to these patients who don't want to go home to their families and they want a place to go sleep and replenish, that's what we're currently using that building for. My question has to do with the, uh, the fear factor that, that we all are going through here. And, and how concerned should the system be? The head of is working in his yard, he has last how concerned should he be about going to the doctor, to the hospital, to the emergency room? Uh, you know, part of what we need to mitigate is also the fear factor. Yeah. If it's here, let's be respectful of it, but let's not be afraid. I think what we don't recognize here at this point in time is that fear. But when we look across the world at what has already occurred and is occurring in other parts of the United States now, New York, some of these other metropolitan areas, that fear is real. And we need the communities to understand that that is real. What we're doing here with the social distancing, keeping people at home, is trying to prevent just what is happening in all those other communities, to overwhelm the health system so that we can't take care of these individuals appropriately like we need to. We expect that we're going to have a lot of patients. It's just how many are we going to have, how severe is it going to be, and will it overwhelm this system that we have set up? Those are the unknowns. If individually we take it upon ourselves to manage this, then we can keep that at bay, maybe. Again, we don't know, but it is gonna take community involvement to take care of this issue. I don't think you'll ever have a person-for-person -person census type count of who has it and who doesn't has it, have it. One thing I can tell you, I know we're all following the CDC guidelines, and that is the most important message we need to um, get out there, is that the CDC guidelines are very clear. These doctors know them up one side and down the other of who, should, who qualifies for testing, who needs it, and who does not. And so one thing that gets confused a lot is, you know, I have friends all over the country that say, hey, we have, we're doing mass testing. 
And it, uh, it's really not mass testing, it's mass screening that then could possibly lead to a test after you're screened out of that first group. And I think it's important to keep that in mind, that the testing that we have done has met the criteria per the CDC. Now, as the doc said, those guidelines are changing all the time. As they're changing, we're changing with those. But at the current time, we're sticking to those uh, pretty darn close to make sure that we're using good, uh, we're having a good out, our resources are going to be good, not just for today, but for tomorrow and for the days to come as well. So I think our testing is right on track, and as long as we stick with the guidelines and stay with what they recommend, I think that that's good business for us. Y'all, anybody else want to say? One of the problems that I think that so many people are having is this fear of running out of something. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Everybody's just concerned that there won't be enough of it. So the latest thing that seems to be a concern to everyone are masks. Should people be wearing masks? And I've gone online, I've listened, I've read pros and cons to it. I've, seen, I've read that the answer is no because those masks need to be saved for our health care workers. What, what's the right response to that on the mask? And if it's yes, they should, are there even any available? Uh, so no, again, I will point back to the CDC guidelines. And the CDC currently says you do not need to wear a mask. So I hope that adequately answers. If, if, if I need to take it a little bit further, if we, are, if we do have access to masks, we should save it for those that are in the front line that will get exposed to this disease. So if you have those at home and you would like to donate those, both hospitals will gladly take it. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much for answering all the questions because you saved us from having to try to answer those questions. So <laughs> thank you very much. Now we move to the um, limited shelter in place um, declaration. I have the authority to sign this declaration, but I thought it would mean more if council did it. Um, to show that we are united in supporting our community. There are things in here we didn't want to do. We wished we didn't have this virus. We wished we didn't have to answer the questions and things like that. But the virus is here. And the key is minimizing everyone's risk. Um, because when you have you're a teenager and you're out running around, you don't think you're ever gonna get it. And you heard all the cases of spring break. These kids were out having a good time at spring break, said, well, we can't get it because we're young. Um, some of them took it back to the University of Florida and contaminated the entire university. So the reason we're doing these things is to minimize everyone's uh, risk of being, uh, coming in contact. It's going to call for a lot of, some businesses will have to close, um, and that is very unfortunate. These businesses didn't do anything to deserve this, but they're doing it for the safety of the community. So I will open up the floor if there's any questions from council. There are guidelines through the U.S. government that allow, in a time of crisis, certain businesses to remain open. It closes some businesses. For example, if there's a tornado, you know, there's certain guidelines. Um, these have been put together by the um, Homeland Security, uh, and they are basically the standard by which we go. When we say shelter in place, we're not saying lock yourself in a closet. 
What we're saying is stay at home as much as possible. We understand sometimes you'll have to go to the grocery store. When you go in that grocery store, stay six feet away from every person. Uh, like one of the doctors said, just imagine everyone has it and you are trying to protect yourself. You can go to the drugstore uh, if you need to get uh, something for fever or maybe you have a prescription you have refilled all the time. You are allowed to do those things. What this does is minimize the people that are out to allow less exposure. Um, our, we are having, um, talking to the major box stores and we are talking to them about limiting how many people can go into a grocery store at once to make sure that we can protect you. Because some of the most dangerous places in this city right now are those lines at grocery stores. You're not six feet away from each other, you're one or two feet, and we are working with retail partners to be able to take care of that. If you've got a question, how do you get it answered? You can email me as the mayor, you can email any one of your council members and we will find the information for you. We also are going to put a uh, frequently asked questions on the city website along with a copy of this. This, a lot of this is very self-explanatory and you can look through it, but uh, you can also contact me on Facebook. Uh, it's David R. Turner, Mayor. I've answered hundreds of questions there. I will be happy to if I can't answer it. If it's a medical question, I can direct you to the people that can. Um, just to make it as easy as possible. I'm uh, going to have a Facebook Live tonight and I will be answering a lot of the questions that people have asked just so that can get out there. But we are going to continue to put things on Facebook, talking about different sections of this. It may or may not apply to you, but that's another way we're going to get the information out. We are also going to talk to the health department and see if we can put out a video talking about coronavirus. We are also going to talk to paramedics and others to be able to get the information out. One of the things that will bring fear down is information. And that is one of the keys right now, what your city is working on, to make sure we get out the information as fast as we can. But there are ways. Send us an email. If you need to make a phone call, we can call you back. But we will get the questions answered. So, yes, ma'am. There is no curfew at this time. Our, uh, one of the cities that we think a lot, Lubbock, has 51 cases. Uh, some of the cases have gotten into their nursing homes. They have gone to the next level. A lot of where we stay as a city, as far as requirements, are going to be on the individual person's shoulders. If we see people out not practicing six foot, gathering in groups of 10. If you're gathering in a group of 10 and you are caught, it can cost you $1,000 or 180 days in jail. We don't want to do that, but it's in there and we can use that. What we want to do is get everybody to comply for the entire community. So. The requirements are, we go along with the requirements from um, the U.S. government, which are 10 people. You cannot have a gathering bigger than 10 people. But when you gather as 10 people, you still have to remain six feet apart. So that is the only way we're allowing gatherings. Many of the churches have gone online. Um, I have seen probably eight or nine different church services just online. That's the way we're recommending it right now. As a Christian, I understand right now is the time we need to be worshiping and supporting each other. But right now, that's dangerous. Uh, and you could infect other people around you. And you don't want to take this illness home to your grandmother because she is more in danger than we are.
Specifics for child care, child care is open. Um, watch the same rules, only 10 in a room at once, and we need to remain um, socially distant. That's hard with kids. What we're doing is when you hand your child over to a, the daycare, keep as much distance as possible where it's safe for the child. We don't want the child to be dropped because you're too far away. But we're just reduce the contact as much as possible. Right, and it also includes very important that children should not change from room to room. Exactly. My granddaughter is in one, and maybe one room has two, and the other has two. The normal thing to do would be put the two in the others, but this says that that can't happen. We can't. And the same set of workers need to stay with their group throughout the day. And if a child starts running fever, same symptoms that we need to watch out for, then that child does not be will not be allowed back in the daycare uh, because they can, can infect all the rest of the children. Other questions? Mayor, if I may add, I maybe put it in perspective, is that uh, we adopted a basic platform a week ago. What we are doing now is adding levels in accordance with what we see in the community right now. That it well That's exactly what we're doing. We don't want to have to go to the Lubbock's level. They have clamped down on everything to pr try to keep the numbers down. If we keep the numbers down, that doesn't overload the hospitals, and it makes it better for everybody. So. We, the community. Well, we've been very blessed. We got. Two of the best hospitals in West Texas. ECISD has been phenomenal. They're feeding people every day to make sure the kids still have food. The county is doing a great job. We're all working together. Nonprofits are doing amazing things. The food bank, to give you an idea, they're talking about giving out 6,000 boxes in one month. That will be a record for the food bank. But they're doing it uh, to make sure our community is taken care of. It's all about taking care of our community. That is our number one job as elected officials. And we take that very seriously. And that's why we're going to the next level. Other questions? Mayor, we received an email today uh, from, in regard to apartment complexes. Now, according to what I've read on this, that doesn't affect maintenance of an apartment complex, correct? No, it does not. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. And then even in their office, as long as they can maintain the social distancing, that does not affect. The only thing it, it affects in an apartment complex are meeting rooms, maybe if they have a, some of them have a pool table and a little game room area, it closes those. But maintenance can still come in and work on your apartment. They can still go to the front office if they have a problem with their key. So apartment complex are just affected in that way. And their pools? Their pools, it's going to be a little cool right now, but uh, probably I would not do the pool right now. Besides, you don't want to see this in bathing suit anyway. So. Other questions? There are two groups, essential and non-essential. Essentials are put together by the federal government, and they are things that are vital for society as a whole. Um, water, food, utilities, to make sure those are fine, making sure you have a plumber if you need it, because if you have a water leak or a pipe burst, you're going to need to get that taken care of for the health and welfare of your um, home. It also keeps the stores open, which are the grocery stores, the drug stores. Um, it allows the contractors, like I talked about, to be out there. Non-essential are talking about things that we don't have to have to live on right now. We don't need to go out and buy new clothes right now because it's COVID season. We don't need to do any of those kind of things. And there are going to be some stores that are closed. and. In this document, if you will read it, it shows you and explains each one of those to you. 
And then I will also um, go into more detail on the Facebook Live to be able to give you the official uh, U.S. government version of essential and non-essential. But some of the most essential people are standing in this room right now. It's our firemen. You need to have fire. You need to have police. You need to have sheriffs. All of those just to maintain civilization as a whole. Uh, but when in this document, we did close things that were considered non-essential, nail salons. I know a lot of women like to get that done, but unfortunately, it's face-to-face -face contact. Um, we also closed the barbers, hair places, things like that, anywhere where there's close contact as part of their service. You can't cut somebody's hair six feet away. And so, therefore, we've closed those down. But any other questions? Okay, I will entertain a motion. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, yes. Okay, we have a motion. We have a motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We now are adjourned. We will do a little we will do a little bit of arranging so that the media can come forward for the press conference with the county. So if you want to we'll move this table out of the way.
Everybody about ready? Sorry, Devin's in charge. I'm just here. Tell me when y'all are ready. We're ready? Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Hayes, and I am the county judge for Ector County. The COVID-19 pandemic has transformed our daily lives and our community in a matter of weeks. Today, we have eight cases. Together with our public health colleagues, the city, the county and leaders of this community, we continue to work as a team to battle the effects of this virus. Today, the county will execute and put into place a declaration local disaster related to the COVID-19. 
For the purpose of this order, individuals may leave their residence only to perform essential activities. But people at high risk of severe illness from the COVID-19 and people who are sick are urged to stay in their residence to the extent possible, except as necessary to seek medical care. Essential services means all services needed to ensure the continuing operation of government agencies and provide for health, safety, and welfare of the public. A list of these businesses that are deemed essential are outlined in the declaration and may, be, and may continue to be operate provided, provided, um, I'm sorry, of government agencies that provide for health, safety, and welfare. Let me read that last paragraph. Essential services means all services needed to ensure the continuing operation of government agencies and provide for health, safety, and welfare of our public. A list of businesses that are deemed essential are outlined in the declaration and may continue to operate, provide federal and CDC guidelines are followed. For the purpose of this order, social distancing requirements include only leave home if you are absolutely have to. Maintain at least six feet distance from each other. Washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds as frequently as possible. Or using sanitizer. Covering coughs and sneezes into the sleeve or elbow, not, not your hands. Regularly cleaning, high touch surfaces, avoid touching of your face, with unwashed hands and do not shake hands and hug, which is very hard for me because I'm a hugger. This declaration will be publicized and filed with the county clerk's office. Please check on the elderly in your neighborhood to make sure that they are okay. A lot of them do not have families in our community and they're counting on their neighbors to help them. Continue to pray for our community, the first responders, medical professionals, and staff, law enforcement, and those that provide essential services, the city, your county leaders, and most of all, I want to thank all of you. May God bless our community, Ector County, the city of Odessa, the great state of Texas, and our nation. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Mayor David Turner. Um, I want to talk a little bit about COVID. A lot of people out there still don't understand just how, in, how important it is to go through the three steps we've talked about. Maintain six feet, wash your hands, and if you're sick, please stay home. Our sister cities around this part of West Texas, uh, Brownwood has three cases, San Angelo has six cases, Abilene has 11 cases. Our sister city, Midland, has 13 cases. Amarillo has 11 cases. We have eight cases. And Lubbock has 51 cases. Tonight, the numbers in Lubbock will go up dramatically. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has made its way into some nursing homes to very susceptible uh, individuals. And we, as citizens of Odessa, are choosing how it's going to hit our community. If you're sick and you're out at a store, you're at the grocery store, wherever, you are putting all the rest of your citizens in danger. And it's not worth it to this community to get sick because somebody decided that they were too important or they just needed to get out because they're going stir crazy. We must stay at home. That's what these orders do. They close some of the businesses that are deemed non-essential. Uh, some of these will be barber shops, uh, hair salons, tattoo parlors, game rooms, and many others. The reason that is is because we need to keep people six feet away from each other. Uh, we are working currently with the grocery stores, uh, with our hardware stores, to make sure they are only allowing 
100 people in to a store at a time. Why? Because if you have 200 people in a grocery store, it's hard to keep the distance of six feet. Some of the most dangerous places in our community right now are some of the long lines at some of these stores because people are not practicing social distancing. If you're within two or three feet of another individual, they cough, they sneeze, you, if they have COVID, you're going to get it. What we need to do is just imagine every person around you has it and you protect yourself. Everybody in this city is not going to catch it, but there will be people that catch it and go outside. So this is a way of taking the declaration that we declared to the next step where we say it's serious and we have to continue to fight it. Our sister city, Lubbock, is going to the next level. They are closing even more services because of the fear that has gripped that community. Mayor Pope is doing a very good job, but some people didn't listen. Some people went into a nursing home and put some people's grandmothers or grandfathers at risk. So Judge Hayes and I will take some questions right now. Uh, so if you have any questions, We'll be happy. We also have some of the physicians here to answer some medical questions that we're not, that we can't answer. Yes? the child care. In the declaration they're outlined whether how many children can be in a room, how many uh, teachers are allowed in there, along with sanitation, and it's all outlined in the declaration that they can get. The general rule is going to be 10, just like the uh, Fed has said. 10 people in a room at one time, six feet apart. That's hard to do with kids, but we're asking them to do the best they can, because child care is one of those critical services that we must have because our nurses, our firefighters, our policemen, all of these people that are critical to the services you enjoy, utilities, medical things, have to have their kids in childcare to be able to serve you. So that is one of the things that we're making sure stay open. Question? We don't know how long it's going to last, to be honest with you. It depends upon the virus. If we take these steps and allow this virus to die down, it will be quicker. If we don't listen to the warnings, this could go on for a little while. So. for all your nonprofits and the nonprofits are very I feel like very essential for our community our food bank the um, Salvation Army um, the United Way they are all essential for our community to help those that are in need when they run out of something I mean they have a source that they can rely on and Ector County and, and the city of Odessa and our community is embraced by some wonderful nonprofit agencies that are, are willing to step up and help your community. There are eight confirmed cases in Odessa. He asked questions about the small businesses that have to close. Unfortunately, when the federal government dictates who is essential and who is non-essential, there are businesses that do have to close. They will have to remain closed until this emergency has passed. That's why we're asking for your help to be able to get businesses open quicker uh, to get people back to work. I'm sorry? There's not a lot of help coming from the city because it's something that we don't have the ability to do uh, with the budgets. But um, 
there is assistance for the employees that are laid off. Uh, unfortunately, I've had to lay employees off so they can get unemployment, and the federal government is working on a bill to bring down some relief for these small uh, businesses through SBA loans and things like that. I can, I can add something to that. The um, Chamber of Commerce has stepped up. Renee Earls and Wesley Burnett have, before I ever had a meeting with them last week, they have stepped up and currently there's a survey online that small businesses and people can take throughout our community to answer questions like how many people um, uh, work are working in your small business. Um, have you completely shut down? Uh, they're going to be able to identify in that survey the industry. They're putting together a list of the bank and financial institutions in our community that will actually have SB loans, SBA loans. So the actually economic downturn of our economy, the chamber, the city, and the county, we are all joined together because we know that at the end of this crisis, we have to address the economic crisis in our community, and we're already addressing that as leaders for you. That's a medical question. So we addressed that just about an hour ago. Uh, I think it's before your team had showed up. Uh, but the CDC guidelines is what we are following. We're not adjusting it. So all the providers in this community are following exactly those CDC guidelines. I did bring pieces of paper to hand out. I think the city manager has those. You're welcome to those. Most of the other people that were here already heard the answer to that question. So the CDC will release newer guidelines and they keep changing all the time. So in the previous answer I had said there was a different guideline about a month ago, and there's a different guideline now and different priori prioritization now. So when the CDC changes those guidelines, that's when we'll adjust it here at a local level as well. We haven't found a need to adjust those outside of the CDC recommendations in our community just yet. But we all are working together with public health as well as all the different hospital systems. So if we feel like there is a need, uh, and, and that's a very, very specific question for medical discussion, if we feel like there's a need, we'll further uh, adjust it specific for our community. But we feel like it's serving our community well to follow those guidelines for now. Any other questions before we close it? Uh, why is that they just did. Yeah, that's what she just did. Today, the county will execute and put into place a declaration of local disaster related to COVID-19. Thank you all very much for coming to your, um, yes, Devin, I saw you raise your hand. If their neighborings are if, within the city, if you see a large gathering, you could call Odessa Police Department. Police Department is enforcing those. As of right now, we are not requiring a letter to be with you saying where you're going, but the police officer will ask questions, and we leave it up to those officers to make sure that that's being taken care of. This will not be enforced in the city until 11.59 tonight. That's when this goes into effect. Or the county. So. There is no curfew in the city. Um, and there, and there's not a curfew in the county. At this time, there is not a curfew. That will be the next level. So thank you all very much, and we're here if you need any other questions. Thank you.